Samurai Stories from Japan. I'm Toby, and today I welcome Ricky. Thank you very much for coming on the show. You came today all the way from Tokyo, and you've been working in Japan and living in Japan for about 20 years now. And that's right. Uh, working mostly in the movie industry, yes, directing right. movies, assisting movies, being on movie sets. <laughs> so we have a lot of questions about this. Okay. And before we dive into this, maybe could you introduce yourself a little bit more to our listeners? All right. My name is Okanda Riki. Um, I was born in Chicago, but raised mostly in Europe. Wind City. Um, yes, the Windy City. <laughs> the Windy City. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I have stories about that one. But um, yes, I've been in Japan for about 22 years now. Mm -hmm. wow. And uh First, I uh, entered Japan, or I came to Japan as a transfer student from DePaul University in Chicago. Okay. So, um, if you want to know, that'd be like um, the X Files Scully is Ooh. from the same university. So she was oh. from DePaul. All right. And uh, I came over to the International Christian University over in Tokyo, where I met my husband. And since then, I just dove into the film industry, where I have been persisting until now. So what What was the reason for you to decide back then, when you were just a student, to move to Japan? Well, it was very arbitrary. Um, I spent most of my youth traveling from country to country mm -hmm. on account of my father's job. Okay. And it was normal for me to change countries. So whether parents were involved or not, if I wanted to go so-and-so place and dad would be like, okay, and he'll send me to boarding school in whatever school, it, in my whatever country so it may pretty, be. Pretty free already at a young age. Oh, yes. So there was no um, sort of feeling of being in one space mm -hmm. at any given time. And when I was in uh, America for university, mm -hmm. um, I had some Japanese friends and I was bored in Chicago. I thought I wanted to go somewhere else. And they suggested, well, why not Japan? I'm like, where's Japan? <laughs> it's Asia. I'm like, oh, that I've never like been there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. But for my dad, it was nothing. So I've been like, dad, I want to go to um, Tokyo. He's like, okay. So... And then I you found, managed to easily transfer to the university in yes. Tokyo. There was no right. major problem, just a couple um, tests I had to fill out mm -hmm. and make sure they wanted me, and it mm -hmm. turned out pretty well. What were you majoring at the time? Okay, um, originally when I was in the University of Chicago, um, I was, when, I, when I was in the University at Chicago, uh, it was supposed to be forensics, mm -hmm. but they didn't have forensics when I went to ICU. I see. Over there, um, instead I transferred over to uh, the Division of Philosophy of Science, which is, yeah. it's kind of history. It's a, it's a kaki ai, <laughs> it's a, um, it's a bridge between the uh, sciences and the arts. Okay. And when I say arts, I mean histo history kind mm -hmm. of level of arts. So you're studying history and what kind of, um, scientific discoveries uh, existed during what sort of um, social political uh, environments oh, interesting. and then you take that and you apply it to future models so what do we have now in the society and how would we like society to move in order to get more of a certain kind of um, you, know, uh, you know eureka moments so, you want to say. so in, in other words based on how what kind of thought process a society has at a given point, mm -hmm. what kind of scientific discoveries are made, mm -hmm. and to kind of predict what kind of scientific discoveries could be made depending on how the society is thinking. That yes. Thing. That sounds super interesting. It's wonderful. And you were able to find this kind of program as well in Tokyo? Well, um, I see it was unique at the time. Mm -hmm. um, it was, I think it was the only university at the time which had that program. In English? Um, they were teaching it in Japanese. However, ICU is a very unique university. Mm -hmm. uh, the teacher, which I, uh, who was in charge of my, um, my, uh, I'm sorry, my thesis, okay. I'm sorry, he was in charge of my thesis, was the one teacher who was able to create that kind of a, a division in the university, and um, he ended up quitting. Cause, well, not quitting, but he was quite old at the time, so it was already in the 70s by the time I arrived there. Mm -hmm. So he was past the age, and that was given over to his. Um, uh, his deshi, I'm sorry, so like his apprentice. The, I'm sorry, yeah. my Japanese is like getting squished yeah, in there. It's, it's <laughs> I apologize. Uh, his apprentice, that's mm -hmm. right. And so his apprentice ended up transferring over to um, Tokyo Tech after that. So I know this because um, my husband, I met my husband because he's in the same division as me, mm -hmm. and he went on to get his doctorate. So okay. um, I know what happened to the, the busho after that, but it's very rare in Japan. You have to um, create it for yourself, and that's why ICU allows you to create your own major. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the places where, a few places in the country where you can do that. 
That's uh, turned out pretty well. <laughs> it's complicated. I'm uh, sorry. So you said that before uh, thinking about moving to Japan, uh, you've never thought of it. You never really considered Japan on the map. No, not really. Um, so how was it for you, despite having moved around quite a bit in your youth, to arrive in Japan? Uh, th you mentioned the 70s, 80s, right? Oh, this was um, this was 2002 when I oh, arrived. Oh, sorry, 2002. I'm that old. Arrived. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. I'm sorry. Um, I know. I look so it. <laughs> 2002, uh, just after the the bubble burst yeah. in Japan. How was it when you arrived in terms of culture shock? What were the things that surprised you the most? Um, in terms of culture shock, uh, well, I was used to transferring from one country to another country to a different school, different language. Mm -hmm. So there was no major um, culture shock in that sense. Um, I've always been one of the types, you know, it's, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans yeah. do, right? So um, I, whatever happened in my life or whatever I encountered was all, was never a matter of it being Japan. Mm. It was just a matter of it being a thing that I happened, see. right? And it was also at the time when you so first start to adult, if you want to say. So until you're 18, 19 or something, you're a kid, right? And when you get hit 20-ish, then you start thinking, well, wait a minute, I have to kind of fend for myself at mm -hmm. this point, right? Mm -hmm. So my transition from um, America to, or a uh, foreign country to Japan, um, it was it came at the same time as my transition uh, from childhood to adult. So I, I would see. learn all the things that I had to do in society um, from a, uh, you know, the manners sort of perspective. And this is the way you do things sort of all you get to learn all that at that same time mm -hmm. period. So there was no, well, they do it that way in my own country. Why don't they do it this way in, my, in yeah, different countries? So you kind of learned adulthood in a way yes. in Japan. And then the Japanese way of doing things became your way of doing things. Yes, right? that's a very good way to put it. But it's interesting what you said as well about um, having no culture shock and basically the differences just being mm. differences yeah. and not being like, oh, this is, why is Japan doing it this way? And, and just, okay, it's done this way and then yeah. I just got to add up. I think that's <laughs> a more open way than sometimes we may read online or see uh, people experience with a sort of like frustrating oh, yes. uh, approach. And now you come all over to Japan, all the way to Japan, and you study and you finish your degree. Yeah. You decide to not continue studies. Mm. How did you start or get into the uh, movie scene in Japan? Well, um, when I first arrived in Japan, mm -hmm. I didn't speak any of the language and I didn't know what from what, mm -hmm. but I needed to get a job. Yeah. And um, I, I don't know. Um, let's see. How did that start? It must have been when, well, I was working, um, well, I used to do musicals when I was a kid. Oh. And so this was when I was over in Europe. Mm -hmm. So I did the whole singing and acting sort of thing as a kid. And the first thing that popped into my head was, let's the singing and acting here in Japan. But I don't speak the language. So that makes it difficult. That would yeah. be a big difference. <laughs> so, but I did discover that they had this thing, you know, the foreign extra thing was quite popular at the time. Mm. So at the time, which I don't recommend to anyone right now because they just don't pay as much as they used to. Mm. But at the time, you could just stand around in the back room, background of a set over there, making it look like you're in a f the characters are in a foreign country and get paid quite a lot of money to do so. Interesting. It was wonderful at so the time. So you'd basically be just uh, one of the extras yes. on set yeah. and just... For the decor. Yes, I'm just a decor. I'm a smiling okay. decor. You know, blonde girl over there in the corner. <laughs> right. But um, you're standing around like decor is, is great when you're getting paid for it, but it's really darn boring. Mm. And um, even when there are those occasional talking parts, it's not, it's not something that it's not considered acting. It's just recitation of a certain kind of a stock character lines. Mm. Right. It was bored as heck. And so what I started to look at was the camera and the lights and that guy over there with the clapperboard. And what that are they all doing? Oh, dude. Mm. And so I asked him questions and they're like, oh, this is a clapperboard. I'm like, wow. And I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. So when I graduated um, university and all those friends started to ask me, what are you going to do when you graduate? Mm -hmm. Are you going to go into a company? Are you going to go home? Or are you gonna go, where are you going to go? And I said, I don't know. And they said, well, why don't you be a director? I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, a, a director dir yeah. from, from being an extra <laughs> on set to director. Well, more. yeah. I mean, in Japan, the system is a little bit different than the mm -hmm. States. So it's not suddenly, um, you're not suddenly a director uh, 
well, everyone's different, of course. You don't suddenly become a director of a project. You start out as an assistant director. Mm -hmm. And that's called a runner at the, well, when you do an 84th. An 84th goes around, runs, and gets coffee and makes photocopies and gives people copies of the sets, uh, of the scripts or the set designs mm -hmm. or whatever it may be. Um, then you go up and there's a third assistant director. And the third assistant director is in charge of the art and the background and the walls and the sets. The second assistant director starts getting in charge of the clothing and the, act, uh, the extras in the back. And the chief assistant director either runs the set or they do it in tandem with the second director and makes the schedules. And also has to contact all of the various uh, departments like lighting and art and whatnot and create a schedule for everybody to move mm -hmm. by. And little by little, the more you study, the higher you get into this, this team. So you start with the least responsibilities yes. and then little by little you learn the extra thing. Yes. It's interesting that they're all called directors in a way, right? Yes. And it's in Japanese, it's, there's no distinction. Mm. So it's called Enshitsubu, which technically means the directorial team. And so oh. what happens is even the main director, sometimes he doesn't want to do it or he has a cold or his tummy is feeling not too good. So he'll throw the scene over to one of the other directors on the team and that person will take over for that particular time. Mm. So everybody knows the script in and out and how they're going to manage it. But it's um, it's really a lot of teamwork involved in there. Yeah, this is uh, maybe a reflection tip of the typical kind of Japanese way of working in yes. groups, all right? Not one person. Uh, we don't see maybe maybe some people are like that, some Japanese directors, but the image of the Japanese Sp Steven Spielberg, for example, yeah. may not be existent, right? It's more like a team of directors. And yes. Yeah. There are famous directors, of, mm, course, of course, but um, they have their own teams that mm. they work with, and that's why they do so well. So, so back then when you started this, like, what was your f the first movie you got into? Oof, well, this was television. television so um, okay. instead of television, uh, it was... Um, The very first thing that I worked on was um, Seigi no Mikata. It was a Nihon television trendy drama, as they call it. Mm -hmm. It's a pop drama. I think it was Wednesday or Thursday nights. I don't remember, but it's an um, evening show around 7 o'clock. Um, Shida Mirai was the name of mm -hmm. the key actress in that one. A little girl who ran around after her um, older sister, who was this evil, crazy boss oh. kind of a situation. It was just typical um, manga kind of a scenario. Mm -hmm. And uh, I worked over Nihon Television for about two seasons. Um, that because each drama is just one season, and so that when that one season is finished, you'll go to another drama, usually with the same team. So the same director and the same um, camera guys, they'll all get together and be like, okay, let's do the next one. Mm -hmm. And they'll take the next Nihon television drama. And then They one don't like extend the drama for like several seasons? Oh, like it's never. Come on the oh, they do that. Um, if the first season sells really, really well, then they will extend it for the next season. But um, unlike the United States, what you're ending up with, what you usually have is you, you have a, um, a set story. Mm -hmm. And so the story is only pitched to the television um, distribution as a single season story. So you'll have eight to 12 episodes and you already know what the episodes are going to be while you start filming. Mm -hmm. right? And then you finish that. Um, I'm sorry, it's a little bit hard to explain here. Um, You're only, you're only getting the actors for that one block of time. Mm -hmm. And you only get the studio and the money for that one block of time. So it doesn't make sense to plan for more if you don't no. have any guarantee to get the actors to get yes. the studio. That's interesting, right? Because if you... So you were doing this in the mid-2000s. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I started learning English, I, I learned a lot from watching American TV shows. Oh. <laughs> and back then, all the TV shows were like usually 24, 24 episodes. Oh, yes, yes. And then it would extend season, season after mm -hmm. season. And now we see also this trend where every uh, TV show that's being released has like eight episodes. Mm. And they also don't want to guarantee more seasons yeah. until they're certain that the audience is there to stay. But Japan seems to have been doing this for much longer. Already. Oh, yes. I mean, if you have to think about it, comparing it to the um, theater. Mm -hmm. So in New York or other Amer American city, if you have a theater um, show which sells really well, it'll go on for what you call as a long run, mm -hmm. right? You go to season, to season, to season. They'll keep on extending it for as long as they want. Um, this also translated into television shows. So as long as you have uh, viewership, you're going to continue to create this one program. Whereas um, in Japan, if you have a, um, I'm sorry, in Japan, if you have a uh, theater, then you have it for two weeks 
maybe a month if it sells really well. Mm -hmm. But you have the theater for that one block of time. You do what you can during that one block of time. But by the next month, it's already blocked, booked by someone else. So you only have that one time, one tr one try to make it sell. If it sells really, really well, you can extend it, but it has to be after the next um, the next one, which already has the next block. That's quite restrictive so, and challenging yeah. as well, right? In yeah. terms of uh, planning and for the writers, you need to yeah. always write for the short term and you don't have any guarantee then. Well, well, we're used to it though, right? Well, there's mm. no guarantee, that's true. But um, you get so used to that kind of a system that by the time you've booked the first drama into your uh, into your schedule, you've already halfway through the, you've already booked the next one too. Because you know when it's going to end and you know what kind of a team you're going to need for so-and-so drama, which is happening on another television station. Mm -hmm. And so you keep on booking and booking and booking and booking because you get used to that. So, so is it then this uh, team of directors that you mm -hmm. mentioned earlier that writes all the scripts for the story? Or do you have a, then a team of writer? And basically, then that just extends everything. There's not one person that's behind the show, but it's just this is one team that produces dramas. Um, well, they, well, it really depends. So you do have the Kumi system. The Kumi system does have uh, um, a kind of a team of directors, and ca usually the cameraman too is part of that mm -hmm. as well. Maybe the writer. But what's more common these days, especially after 2002, we had the whole Lehman crash and all oh, that, yes. right? So things started to go a little bit crazy then. But um, it's very based on one particular show. So you, one team for one show. And then you'll go, you'll be free again. And then you grab each other. If if you're not busy the next one, you're mm. going to grab all the staff that you can get and move on to the next one. But um, usually you'll have one writer. If it's a very complicated story, like something with a um, cop show or maybe mm. something like a... a um, you got uh, hospital kind of a oh, show. Oh, they're quite popular, right? They're, oh, they're yes. TV dramas with uh, police officers or with hospitals, oh, yeah. which actually is the case as well in the United States. It Most is dramas <laughs> are like crime dramas. It's huh? a crime show. It's a legal show or, or it's a show. doctor show. Yeah. And that's what you get. You have one love drama, usually for high school students. Mm. But yeah, but it's usually just one writer. And sometimes the director will come in there and, tr and try to help fix the script. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the one writer, the producer, the director maybe two producers and the director in a meeting with this writer. And this poor writer has to kind of figure it out all by themselves. Um, you don't have the whole team of writer thing that you have in the United States. Another thing you mentioned is, so you book a studio set yes. for like uh, one month. Yeah. And now that I think about this, uh, in the United States, for example, you regularly see images on social media of like, mm -hmm. oh, they closed down the street, they're filming this movie. And mm -hmm. like you see the actors and the TV yeah. crews on the streets. I've actually never seen this in Japan, where they close down yeah. uh, city blocks to film a popular movie or something like that, yeah. a car chase or whatever. Is yeah. everything always done on in a studio set? Um, no, we do have locations, but um, we do not have the budget to shut mm. down a street. I will promise you, we do not have the budget for it. Um, the few locations that we can do something like that, we would have to be outside of Tokyo. Like countryside locations. Um, yeah. And, mm. Or, um, for example, Kobe is one place which is very uh, Kyoto. It's very, it allows you to film that kind of a thing. Or um, uh, Kita Kyushu, so northern Kyushu mm -hmm. also as well. It's a place where we can go to film car chases. Um, you can never do that in Tokyo. No, <laughs> so, I can't imagine. So, so when, for yeah. example, uh, mm -hmm. uh, an American movie like uh, the Fast and Furious series ah. had the Tokyo Drift yes. at, uh, a movie, and they actually did film on location, that must have been yes. then a huge investment for them too. Well, um, that's an American budget, mm. right? So an American budget is 10 times the budget that we have here. Mm. So um, that's unique. In addition to that, it, most of it um, wasn't actually shot in Shibuya. Some cuts may have been especially the ones that were in the car, maybe. But um, I know the line producer on that one oh, as well. <laughs> so good friend of mine. But um, yeah, it's it's a lot of movie magic. So most of it is not shot at as is. Mm. And Tokyo is not very kind when it comes to filmmakers, unfortunately. Yeah. So I want to get back a little bit mm. uh, to your story. When you started, then you finished your university and you started as an assistant director yes. on those movie sets. So what you also called runner. Yes, I was a runner. So <laughs> how was that experience for you, kind of just run, running around the sets and uh, carrying everything <laughs> everywhere? It's, it's brutal. Um, I do have to tell you that uh, one of the reasons that the movies industry is, I guess, I mean, it's a very hard industry, mm. right? And um, 
the, especially at the time, which is of course 20 years ago, uh, it was what you call in Japanese taikaike. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a tough industry and everybody kind of yells at each other and they're always, they kind of look angry and they're kind of gruff to one another. They're not a bunch of gentlemen here in this industry, right? So um, uh, it would also, it would also include, it included extreme long hours. So I remember the call time would be something like five in the morning mm -hmm. and we'd be done at two in the morning the next day. And then we'd have call time in the morning again, five the next morning. So um, it was very common. The runner has to be the one who's constantly on set. So I'd be sleeping on set or in the staff room or in the bus in order to just to make it to the next day. Um, it's not as bad now. So this 20 years has mm -hmm. passed. So it's a lot easier right now. Um, usually the call times are no longer five in the morning. They're more like eight and nine and mm -hmm. someone will complain about it and will be done at seven o'clock in the afternoon. So it's a big difference than it was then. Well, seven o'clock in the afternoon is already it's evening. Into, into the <laughs> yes. evening, right? But it's nothing compared to what it used yeah. to be. So I think overseas yeah. they still have that, right? My, my cousin uh, so. works, she does costumes oh. for a TV show and... Uh, also very mm -hmm. long hours because oh, you constantly yeah. need to be especially because it's a it's a period piece yeah. so very complex costumes and fighting scenes so a lot of damage done on the costume <laughs> oh, yes. that always needs constant fixing yeah. so long hours outside and uh, it is it's so that was a was tough hard. period for you to you know i'm graduated from college mm -hmm. right i do not have a degree in film i have a degree in um, <laughs> you know philosophy of science um running around on set um at the time i was the only girl on set um, so of course I had a lot more energy back then, so I could run around and I could carry lights and I could, mm -hmm. um, you know, hold the scaffolding and do whatever I had to do, but it was just so constant and there was no respite whatsoever. So it was a lot of tears at the time, yeah. but I got through it because, um, I tended to be, I'm very, mm, I'm very stubborn. I'm kind of an idiot too. <laughs> so <laughs> if I choose something, then that's the only option. There's, there's no mm. other option. I've already started it, so I have to finish it. Right. And Go so all the way. I just kept on going and, you know, 20 years goes by and you realize, oh, that was nothing compared to, you know, I'm glad I went through that time, which was tough. And I'm glad that I toughed it out because now I have all this experience that um, newcomers to the film industry, which is not bad at all, mm -hmm. um, they don't have yet. And it's nice to be in a position to be able to tell the kid that it's okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's going to be okay. You're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. You know, now that I've gotten to this point, but at the time, I mean, every time I would be on set, I wanted to quit. Right. So um, I'm glad I did it at the time. How was it with the language? You said that at the beginning you didn't speak yeah. uh, any Japanese. And then you said one of the reasons you worked on, on sets was you were the foreign person on set. You just had to look foreign and you didn't need to speak. So yep. it was a great job. But once you're a runner, you need to communicate. Yeah. You need to understand uh, the, uh, the whatever the director above you is asking you to do, yeah. whatever the person you bring something to is asking you to bring back. And mm -hmm. how is it uh, language-wise? Oh, language. Um, well, since I don't have a Japanese background, mm -hmm. um, language was always and still is. It is the, the hurdle. That's the only hurdle that there is. Mm -hmm. um, I was learning Japanese on set which was beneficial because people did understand that, you know, you know, I'm, I'm a foreigner, right? So there were times when I could tell that they wanted to tell me something and it wouldn't get through and they, would, they wouldn't get angry. They'd be like, okay, never mind. And then they'll turn it to the next person. And so they would give me that kind of leeway um, to an understanding mm -hmm. because I didn't really quite get it. Um, these days too, uh, I've been here 20 years, but of course I'm not a native. So I can't write my own scripts or um, there will be times when I'm not quite, I don't quite understand what's going on. Um, uh, especially when you're talking about something, you know, making a Jedi gig, you're making a film of the Edo mm -hmm. period, and all this really crazy Japanese comes out about things that we don't use anymore. Yes, yeah, so old, old Japanese, oh, old yes. characters. And oh, that comes out all the time. Mm. So um, even now, that's kind of a hurdle. I have to continue to study and I have to be very vigilant about it. But um, the language is less of an issue so much as uh, the trust. So I've been, of course, in the industry for 20 years now. So I know the people, I know the names, mm -hmm. I know the system. So even if I'm not 100%, even if I'm somewhere about hovering around 80%, the producers know that I can do it. And so they'll give me the jobs to do anyway, because they figure, okay, well, this person's been here 20 years and here's a, a native person who's been here in the industry for three months. <laughs> well, which one are we going to choose? Mm. Um, they'll, they'll usually choose someone with a little bit more experience. Is it so. an industry where 
people know each other. Yes. You mentioned that you 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 are uh, friends with the line producer of the person that was on the Fast and mm -hmm. Furious movie. You worked on many movies. Is it like everyone knows each other and the crews know each other and kind of cooperate? Yeah, uh, very much so. Yeah. So um, even within the industry, when we're drinking, we like to say that the industry is only made up of 50 people. Mm. So everybody knows everybody. Um, even if you don't know them right away, you, they'll start asking you questions about your background. And that's a very Japanese thing. So the background is very important. The first question everyone will ask always, whether you're foreign or Japanese or no matter what, they will ask you, where are you from, right? And you can answer and, you know, you can say for some foreigners are like, well, I'm from Chicago, right? Whereas a most Japanese person will be like, oh, well, I'm from Tokushima or I'm from Hokkaido. And they will start thinking about your accent. Maybe. Well, they will, especially if you're, you're from Kansai. Mm. Then, the, then they're both from Kansai, and all of a sudden you'll get the Osaka, and then you go, "Well, I'm from Kobe, so it's your your um, Kansai band is different than my Kansai band." They start Local picking at each other. Yeah. Oh, it's wonderful! <laughs> it's so much fun. Um, but yeah, they'll start there, and then they'll be like, "Okay, well, why are you in this industry?" And then they'll poke around in the back until they find that one person that both of you know, and that's where the friendship starts. Interesting. So, so th there is this kind of, if you want to maybe get started yeah. or make a career in that industry, there is the need for networking. Yes, like, very yeah. much so. It's the same thing over in Hollywood or any other mm. place. So. so if someone would want to start today to mm -hmm. join that industry, it might be quite a different journey than you've been on. Uh, well, I'm not entirely sure because, you know, everyone's going to have their own in their mm -hmm. own journey anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So who I met 20 years ago is going to be very different than who someone meets today, right? And maybe they're going to meet the right person at the right time, or maybe they don't. Or maybe they're going to meet the wrong person, and then they'll meet another person and be like, you remember that person? That person's a jerk. Oh, yeah, he's a jerk. And all of a sudden, you guys are friends now. So um, you can't really imitate somebody else's method of starting anything, mm -hmm. whether it be film industry or any other industry, you're just going to have to do, just jump in there and then see who you meet and kind of pick and choose the kind of people you want to be around in order to create your career, of course, right? Is it so. an industry that's open to foreigners though? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Yes, especially it has a history of being so. Mm. So um, the industry itself, even to, yeah, so when we say foreigners, we're just talking about us who are like Europeans, right? Yes. But um Generally speaking, if you look into the industry, a huge portion of it is actually um, a, a Korean or a Chinese background. Mm -hmm. So even other industries, which are usually family-based, uh, especially when it comes to tea or kimonos or something which has three, four, five generations, that's going to be something that, of course, is going to be Japanese, right? Well, this industry, they don't care where you come from. They're just asking whether or not you can do the job. Mm. And so they don't really ask you about your background so much as, well, you carry that. Can you do it? Yes, <laughs> or you can say hi, or whatever language comes out. Mm -hmm. If you can carry it, you can carry it. And so they're not really so concerned with your background so much as whether or not you know you can run around and get the coffee on time. You know. After 20 years in the industry, now you've directed quite a few movies. So you went all the way from the runner to uh, you yeah. climbed up the stairs. <laughs> and um, how was it like to be on set as a director for the first time? Um, it wasn't a big deal because. Um, I've worked on a lot of different kinds of projects mm -hmm. and some of them are very small and some of them are huge, right? And you tend to kind of, uh, especially when you're a first time director, they don't give you a massive project in anyway. So you're getting something really tiny, really small, maybe it'll go on the internet, something like that. And you end up with a very small crew that you already know, right? So one of the backgrounds that you do have over in Japan from spending many years in there is you get to know the crew. Right, and you have to create your own crew. Mm -hmm. So this is called a kumi system, like I mentioned a little bit before. But you get your own cameraman because you call your own cameraman. You call your own sound guy. Um, you call your own uh, the writer. Usually it's a producer's writer, but um, you kind of know the people you work with anyway. And so you want to take some particular cut. You just tell George over there to go move his camera over to mm -hmm. the right. Right. So it is not a huge transition from one to the other. And by the time you become a director, you've already um, taken a number of short films anyway. You're messing around with the camera constantly, seeing what you can do. So it's not really uh, diving into the deep end kind of a feel. What are the kind of movies that you've directed in Japan or that you enjoy directing the most? I like cop shows. Okay. Um, cop shows are the most fun because uh, 
one thing about the cop show is that the structure has already been created, mm-hmm. right? So we already know what the ukezara is going to be, right? So the, the case and the resolution of yes. the show. You mm-hmm. know what's going to happen, right? And you know how certain shots are going to be taken, mm-hmm. right? So you have to, you know, the guy with the gun and he's going to go run after the, the girl and she's running over around the corner. And that kind of a shot, you only there's only so many um, outcomes you can have right there, right? So within this box, what can you create? And so the, mm. the concept of the fill of the um, crime show is especially exciting because there's only so so much you can do with it. So um, how to use your own imagination to make this quickly and easily and cheaply um, in a way which is also kind of unique. Um, it's kind of like a game. So I, yeah, I think the cop shows are the most fun. How would you compare uh, now from your insider perspective, like uh, cop shows in Japan to in the United States? Whew. <laughs> Well, I recently had, recently had a nice discussion with um, a producer from a television show that I worked on in Kyoto recently. And um, when we were discussing what kind of show to make next, um, I have a background in forensics. Mm-hmm. So I turned in a number of um, actual forensic cases that I had translated into Japanese mm-hmm. that I studied during when I was in college. And I thought they were, had good stories behind them. And it was slightly disappointing, I'll tell you that. Because okay. um, one of the big differences uh, between cop shows over there in the States and cop shows here is that in the States, they try to get as close to reality as possible. Well, well also being kind of stupid, you know, <laughs> to mm-hmm. a little extent. You know, you don't know someone's DNA by looking at the dude, okay? Yeah. But you can do that over in CSI, apparently. But um, in Japan, if there's anything that's close whatsoever to reality, they can't use it. And the reason is... Um, Chijoha, which means regular television. Um, they're afraid of people claiming that it's too close to the real thing or something real ha- like that happened to them or that some sort of guy is going to look on TV and the bad guy is going to look kind of like a badass and he's going to copy him or something like that. And it'll be that TV show's fault. That's super interesting. Yeah. The last point you make, because mm-hmm. every time there is a crime Let's say some guy pulls out a knife Mm -hmm. on a train station, stabs someone. Mm -hmm. The evening news will show you exactly how he did with the 3D reconstruction. (laughs) right? So the news are kind of explaining step by step how the the, the bad person uh, committed a crime. Mm -hmm. But then in a TV show, which is supposed to be fictional, Mm -hmm. you can't do that. Yeah. So for, for the TV shows, uh, for crime shows especially, I, so I, I like crime shows as well and I watched probably way too many growing up in mm-hmm. English. And it's often action-packed, yeah. there's a very specific theme to it. And I felt when watching Japanese shows, there is this some, something missing sometimes yeah. from looking, have, coming from an American background yeah. of uh, TV shows. Why do you f- feel that, uh, in just in terms of uh, cinematically, mm. it, it's more simple? It's more kind of less editing or less mm. action than... Well, um, the reason for the less editing and action is the honest truth that we just don't have time to take mm. it. Um, from the very beginning, when you gather the staff until you finish the, um, finish the program and you're on to the next one, it's about a month, month, month and a half, right? And during that time, you're taking 12 episodes. So by the time you're actually filming the very last episode, you have got the script in the morning. That's when you get it, Mm. right? There is no time whatsoever. So also for the actors, no time to prepare. Oh, no time whatsoever. Not at all. Um, So usually in the first or second episode, if there is some kind of a cool action and um, butt kicking or anything like that, it's going to happen in the first and second episode because you have at least least two or three weeks to plan what the action is going to look like. That's usually when the head director takes those first two Mm -hmm. episodes, right? Um, But by the end of it, I mean, you really have no time. And there has been no time to rehearse. There's been no time to practice any action. You have to call in someone who's an action specialist to be on set for those kinds of a scene. To be able to just improvise it on the spot. Yeah, you do. Because, I mean, the actors here, I mean, like, unlike America, um, you don't have a a month to create a character like that. They've been filming until, Mm -hmm. you know, three hours before on the same day. A completely different role. So it's kind of like the old, old Hollywood, way back in the 1910s, 1920s, when you had um, people working on multiple projects at a time. There's just seriously no time to um, put into the project. 
And so you remember, um, oh, goodness gracious, like X-Files or something awesome mm -hmm. like that. Um, you have the characters of Mulder and Scully and their whole lives are built around creating these wonderful characters that are working yeah. for the FBI, right? So they learn how to hold the gun and they learn mm -hmm. how to um, learn what kind, how to re uh, recite their lines in a convincing way. Um, whereas in this, uh, over here in Japan, what you get, what you see is what you get. So you have to use the actors as are, as they are, and you can't really put enough acting and a uh, methodology into them uh, to create a really convincing character. So we do have those kinds of limitations. So how does the audience react to this? Um, I would say that our we are having an issue with um, whether or not the projects are interesting. Mm. Right? Um, which is, we're in a very interesting transitional period right now. So it's changing. Things it, are changing. It is. Mm. But I mean, obviously. So think of it, we don't have the, um, the ratings that, for example, we would have had 20 years ago. Because mm -hmm. 20 years ago, we had no internet, right? So it was television or the movies or nothing, really. But here, now we have the internet. And now we have all these new online channels, right? So everything that was used to be you had to sit down in front of the television at a very specific time if you want to see this TV show. Mm -hmm. Well, now you don't even have to do that. Now you can go on to TVer and see um, and see Replace the same thing whenever replayed. you want. Yeah. yeah. Or you could go to, um, you can go to what, Netflix right now or Hulu or all these different kinds of um, TV shows which are online, which no longer have the same kind of limitations, mm -hmm. right? So now we have a little bit more time to film. And now we have some more time or uh, a little different kind of a budget so that we can make something a little bit more realistic and the sponsors are not going to complain about it, right? So everything that we knew about the film industry, including the television industry in Japan, is changing right now. And so this is kind of coming after yeah. an impact of all these maybe foreign online streaming services yeah. and... Uh, the internet that has brought access to a lot of foreign movies as well. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Interesting. So I remember when um, Netflix first came here, it was about 10 years ago, I'm guessing, maybe around that. Mm -hmm. um, everyone was saying this wonderful phrase, Kuro fune ga kita. The black ship came yeah. like when they came with uh, Matthew Perry. Right? That's right. Yeah. You got it. <laughs> so Matthew Perry is here again, mm -hmm. which they were expecting change. And unfortunately, at the time, um, Netflix didn't end up being the black ship that they were looking for. So they were hoping that um, through using the internet, that things that are made in Japan could be distributed worldwide. Mm -hmm. And what Netflix ended up doing instead was to um, was to regional, make a regional thing for everything. There's, so there's Netflix Europe, there's Netflix Japan, Netflix yes. Asia, whatever mm -hmm. it is. And um, so the things that are made in Japan can't necessarily be seen over there in America. For example, I can't tell my sister to go see so-and-so drama because she can't see it, right? But... Um, it, as, a, as a backlash, or, or not to say backlash, but um, as a reaction to that, um, Japan started making all their own kind of channels. So they held mm. the TV thing right now. And they have, um, you know, there was a Hulu, of course, it was uh, working with Neon Television. They had a Wow Wow. Well, wow Wow right now is great if, if you want to see cop shows. Okay. So all these little tiny channels right now are popping up. And so the television, as we know it, has all this wonderful competition. And so if you think, okay, well, you can't do this on regular television. Well, let's try to do it over on Netflix, right? And so there's this kind of a, a, a wonderful fight between all these different kinds of uh, subscription channels mm -hmm. and regular um, commercial channels and everything. And it's forcing everyone to kind of re-examine the environment in which they're working. Yeah, so the, all the, the, the giant TV industry with TV Asahi, TV oh, yeah. something, TV something, that were dominating production mm -hmm. for everything and had control over everything yeah. are now losing some of it to these online services oh, and have are. to reevaluate how they do. Yeah. So uh, do you think that based on that, and maybe in a few years we'll see, because we already do see some Japanese TV shows maybe produced by Netflix or mm. so that are up to international standards oh, yeah, in, in terms of like the foreign audience also likes it. Yes. Uh, some live action from some anime, some are a flop as well, but some work out well and yeah. some movies. And we also see a regional rivalry, right, with mm. Korean movies and Korean dramas, which have really been a hit all over the world uh, in the last few That's years. That's a matter of marketing and distribution. Mm. So I'm not going to go that. If you go into that, you're going to go into a really like heavy, where does the money come from kind mm. of a story. Interesting. So let, let's so maybe let's leave that out. <laughs> it's but too it's, complicated. It's interesting <laughs> because they are putting the effort yeah. into internationalizing their, They're thinking about uh, it. their drama. But in Japan, it's still coming a bit slower. Yeah. 
there has been maybe more focus on just the domestic market. Well, one of the things that uh, is kind of getting into nitty gritty, nitty gritty here, but um, one of the reasons why Japanese film and television is not so interested in the foreign market is partially the distribution thing. So um, there is no, unlike um, aforementioned country, there's no money from the government. Mm. So in um, countries like Korea, you're getting 80%, 90% of your budget from the government oh. in order to, so that they can distribute and create a market for themselves outside of the country. Okay. Um, Japan is not doing that. There's no money from the government. Nothing. So it's all financed by the companies. Yeah. So that's why they're so bent on the commercials. Mm -hmm. You can't do anything offensive because you can't make any um, thing uh, imitable in terms of like crime shows or anything like that because everything is being paid for by so-and-so beer, you know. Um, But back to the question, one of the reasons beyond that is um, there haven't been contracts until now. So until now, Japan is a very much um, shake your hands kind of agreement kind Mm -hmm. of a thing. Um, but when you're talking about worldwide market, you're talking a lot about, um, well, where do they get the royalties from and who's going to be in charge of the royalties and using someone's image or someone's music or someone's story or something like that. It's what used to be kind of like, can I use your story? Yeah, sure. Go right ahead. Suddenly became, can I use your story? Well, where are you going to use it? Oh, you're going to use it in America. Don't we have to have a lawyer for that? I think we have to have a lawyer for that. Um, does someone know a lawyer? That kind oh, of a reaction is okay. happening right now. That makes everything a lot more complicated. Oh, yeah. And you know, once you put in contracts and lawyers and stuff, now suddenly, wait a minute, I thought you were just going to use my story. Now we're going to have a contract? What is that supposed to mean? So there's this mistrust of the contract culture and that sort of thing. <laughs> Which is interesting because you would assume a contract will bring more trust into a partnership that both parties will respect the terms of the agreement more yeah. than if it's just a handshake and someone might just like backstab you and just yeah. run away with your story, right? Well, that's why, for example, I remember way back when I first came over here, a lot of foreign companies would complain that things just don't move forward in Japan. It takes a long time to do business, whereas you go to somewhere like next door and they'll, they'll shake on the same day, mm-hmm. right? One of the reasons is that um, Japanese really enjoy creating that level of trust. And they're used to creating that level of trust before you work with someone. So back to the story you were sharing about you go for dinner and they'll poke around you to find who you know that they know. And then you kind of start building that trust. Yes, that's right. So that sort of a thing. So once you start um, kind of uh, picking at that, you know, sort of a system of trust that they have over here. Well, that's that's when they're starting to, you know, they're thinking, well, maybe we shouldn't do mm-hmm. anything at all, and let's not let's not move this project forward. And so it takes years to move something forward for those kinds of reasons. Mm. And now, for you personally, as a movie director, mm-hmm. what kind of projects would you like to work on? What kind of uh, things you'd like to start, uh, given the opportunities in the, in the coming years? Ooh. Well, I'm always turning in the project plans. So if I think of something well, right away, I'll put it onto paper mm-hmm. and I'll send it off to a friend and maybe they'll pick it up, maybe they won't, maybe I need to polish it some more and Mm -hmm. then I'll send it back again. Um, uh, Well, I have to say that um, in the last three, four years, it's the first time I started to use social media. And until now, I was completely involved in just the Japanese side of the media. Mm -hmm. I wasn't interested in what's going on abroad or how um, other foreigners were thinking about what I was making, right? But... I'm speaking in English online about these sort of topics, it kind of opened up another kind of world to me where um, there are these people who would love to have more access to Japanese media and Mm -hmm. there's just no linguistic bridge for it. No, or cultural it's very bridge. difficult to find some you know, some translations. Some yes. large media are starting to mm. put out English versions. Some newspapers are yes, doing yes. it. And, but it is, yes, still it's quite tough. linguistically it restricted. Yeah. So I was... Um, in my recent projects, if it's something that I personally am making mm-hmm. and it doesn't have um, an original story, if the original story is with me, then what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, um, I'll novelize it first, I'll write it by myself, um, put it into a story, and then I'll write the screenplay for it, have the screenplay fixed by um, Japanese friends and writers mm-hmm. and things like that, and then I'll put it to film. And this is over the last two, three years that I've started to move into projects like that something which I'm expecting to be able to distribute, first of all, online. Um, And the reason to do it online is so that more people who are interested in it can watch it. And so I've been, even when I was working recently with Japanese television, I would suggest to them 
um, if you're going to put it online, if it's going to be on Tiver, well, why not offer a subtitled version? I'll do the subtitles for you for free, but they're just not interested. Mm. So I have to create the project with the subtitles and with the foreign audience in mind without making it something that would be um, so extra. foreign. Yeah, yeah, so foreign that it would be not really a Japanese film at all. So I want to get into projects more like that kind of way. Why so would they refuse to have uh, an additional set of foreign subtitles for free and the possibility to maybe touch a new audience and kind of get new viewers or interested right. people? It's, it goes back to the contract problem. Mm. So they're not contracted for um, international distribution for the theme song or um, so-and-so uh, international distribution of so-and-so character's um, personality or something like that. I don't know what it is. But, um, or yeah, and a lot of the projects now, um, they come from manga, you know, yes, cartoons. Yes, uh, I mean, the One Piece live action oh, just yes. came out, produced by uh, Netflix. And uh, So that one's a, a unique case, but mm -hmm. a lot of the, most of the things you'll see on television are originally manga. Mm -hmm. So the, that particular manga, when it was first contracted to be a Japanese television show, wasn't going to have the foreign audience in mind. And so when they say, well, it could be shown abroad, mm -hmm. they'll be like, well, uh-oh. And of course, I'm not going to get too far into it, but there are certain things happening in other countries which are socially, there are social changes, and in one country something's okay, in another country it's not okay, and there's a lot of fighting going on in those countries regarding social issues. And then suddenly they'll attack the Japanese stuff too. Well, why aren't you on our side, whatever the side that mm -hmm. may be? Um, and I, I think I recently saw a Japanese uh, writer, I think maybe it was Dragon Ball or something like that, a quite popular manga artist who was confronted by such people. Like, well, why isn't your thing more global? And he's like, they're Japanese characters. It's Japan. Don't pick on my characters. I like mm. them as they are. And I don't remember who it was, but that's what most um, writers don't want to deal with, right? They don't want to deal with the, the global attack. They're just like, you know, My audience is here. It's They'll these people. They'll understand what I'm doing, and yeah. I don't need to kind of face the stress of uh, yeah. potential backlash. Interesting. They don't want to. They don't want to so, deal with So this is what's in a way preventing the maybe lack of international collaborations on movies as well. Yeah, I Japan. can see that. Yeah. I can see that. So for you, in now these this 20 year career as a movie director, um, what were some of the most rewarding kind of experiences you've had on, on set? Hmm. I would say that um, on set in general, it's hard to make films. Mm. So even though it's fun at certain points and it's wonderful collaborating with all these wonderful creators and talented people, um, it's really hard. And you're constantly battling through every single day when you're filming something. Right? Mm -hmm. um, the most rewarding time actually comes when you're in some random izakaya And you'll be talking to some dude which you met over there and they realize you're on film and they'll ask you what show you work on and you'll say it and their face will light up. Wow. It's like everything suddenly changes for them. And they're like, wow, so you met so-and-so and you did this and was that was so cool. I've always wanted to work in film. And they have this kind of a wonderful starry-eyed view of the film industry. And when you're in there, of course, it's just work, you know, it's, it's tough. But then you're then to hear someone say that they enjoyed what you made. That's a reward. It's like, wow, so maybe I am doing something cool. Mm. I mean, this is fun because you're making it for an audience, right? If there is no audience, there is no film. Yeah. Right? So to hear the audience say that they enjoy it, um, that's the most rewarding part of this kind of a job. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, you, it's a lot of work, a lot of stress, and mm -hmm. it's only once you have the finished product mm -hmm. that you can kind of take a deep breath and be like, w we did this one, Yeah. until you start the next one, and then it's like <laughs> all, all over again, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. And do you have any maybe interesting anecdotes of uh, kind of people you met on set uh, that were mm -hmm. unexpected or that... Uh, well, I did one foreign film when I was in Japan. I was assistant director on the uh, film G.I. Joe Snake Eyes. And um, it's a B movie, mm -hmm. so <laughs> it's not a world-class, top-class movie. But I have to say something about the, about the um, staff and cast. They were so respectful while they were here. They were just absolutely great in terms of culture, and they didn't want to cause any trouble. They didn't try to destroy anything, as so many film people tend to do. Um, they weren't rude to the locals or anything like that. They just loved being here in Japan, right? And I remember there was this one time on set, 
um, where the director, is a wonderful German guy, he was very grouchy. And it was a grouchy day and it was raining <laughs> and it was midnight, like two in the morning, couldn't get the cut. Everything was going wrong. And um, uh, for various reasons, because of my background, I do Japanese tea. And I brought my tea set to the set. I've all, I always bring my tea set wherever I go um, when I'm on the film set. Mm -hmm. right? And so what I did is I didn't say anything. I just took out the tea set and I put it on a little, I don't know, I think it was like a stump or something because we were filming in the forest. And I put down the tea bowl and I put, poured, and I put in the tea and I poured the hot water and I started to mix the tea. And I don't know if it, you know what it sounds like, but when you mix tea, it's like shush, shush, yes. shush, 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 shush. It's a very unique sound. Mm -hmm. I just started doing that. And then the director, he's like, and he looks at me and he looks down at the thing and he just kind of chills. And all of a sudden the set gets really quiet. The ASMR tea making. Just that sound is all you get. And the director looks over and goes, what's that? I'm like, it's matcha. He goes, is that that drink thing? I'm like, yeah. Would you like some? He's like, yeah, I'd like that. And so I, you know, I give him the tea bowl and he sits there and he drinks the tea bowl. And suddenly it's like all that tension that was in the mm, air. Just all gone. All gone. And he's sitting there with the tea bowl and it's, you know, I don't know what time, but it was pretty cold. I remember that. <laughs> but he was like, okay, let's try it again. And it was just, it was just a wonderful moment of um, just this tiny little tea bowl, which kind of fixed everything mm -hmm. for the day. After that, I um, brought out the tea bowl a couple other times on set, but it was never as dramatic as that one moment. And that's uh, the power of tea. We just had a, a tea ceremony master on the oh, podcast. Yes, I saw week. her. Yeah. And a similar experience as you just described, it, it is something more than just a cup of tea. It's a process oh, yeah. of making it in. Um, well, it's great that you kind of have such fun memories of yeah. uh, of this time. Have there been maybe some more challenging moments, uh, p people to work with, or uh, uh, that you may have uh, not expected, kind of? Well, every every project is going to have its challenging mm -hmm. moments. Um, I do remember, like goodness, at least once. During most projects, I'm doing something really, really menial. And I'm like, why the heck am I doing this? I am 40 years old. Why am I standing out on the edge of a pier at in February, snowing, holding a lamp so that a car can go by? Mm. <laughs> and I'll just get really frustrated for a few seconds during that time because you're waiting for the cut to start, right? And the cut doesn't start. and you're waiting for the car and it's supposed to go by and, and it doesn't go by and then go by and you're like still you know, cold is this what i'm getting paid for mm -hmm. to stand here like you know and just it it really eats at your um i'm gonna say it eats at your pride right like what did i go to college for mm -hmm. <laughs> so um that happens at least once during every season well i have that moment like what am i doing here this little moment right. of uh, being overwhelmed oh yes by the elements oh yes especially you know during the hot summers mm. or the really cold winters you're like yeah, this what? summer in particular <laughs> was very hot we were just talking about it before oh, yeah. we started it's been really really brutally hot oh yeah for the last oh, two yes. months i imagine you've worked with many many people over yes. 20 years is there someone in particular that you haven't had a chance to work with and that you'd really like to to meet or kind of do a movie or show together? Oof. Goodness gracious. Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really thought about it. Um, I'm issue. fortunate that yeah. the industry here is very, very small. Oh. So um, if I really want to meet somebody, then I'll, I'll poke someone and someone knows someone and someone mm -hmm. knows someone. And, um, and then next week I'll have them sitting in my living room, right? And we'll having a drink together. Mm -hmm. So I'm fortunate to have that kind of a network after 20 years of being in this industry. Um, well, it is something you build over time. So, yes, yeah. that is true. So in that sense, not really, but I do want to be able to get to a level where I can make um, I can make a jidai mono. So jidai mono is the, the period, is the piece. period pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there are some that I'm really interested in, certain time periods that I'm very interested in. Um, but I know that to make them, even though it's not really a big budget over in the United States, over here, it's like, it's a huge budget. You know, you make four of those kinds of movies a year and they mm -hmm. all lose money because there's just, um, there's not enough of a market for that particular genre. So um, I'm trying to work up towards being able to do that. Um, these days I've worked with a number of producers which are 
generally veterans in the industry, which is nice because they've been going through that kind of process of making period films. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's something that it's one of my goals during this time period. So maybe, you know, I'm around 40 right now. So I'm assuming that maybe mid fifties, I'll be able to do that. So it's hard. It's hard to get into that particular genre. You mentioned uh, budget a couple of times. Oh, is yeah. it okay to talk, uh, to get sure. an idea of <laughs> estimates of what, what <laughs> is uh, the, the budget for, for example, one of these uh, cop shows you mentioned Up earlier, you, you film for <laughs> one month, you have 12 episodes produced for TV with mm. a set amount of actors, directors, writers. Yeah. How, what kind of budgets are we talking about? All right, the, here's the problem. Um, I only know the numbers in Japanese. Let's talk in Yen. Can you, can you, if I tell you what it is, you know what that is in English? I'll give it my best try. All right. Well, let me tell you the low end. The mm -hmm. very lowest end. And this is a one of those shows that you see um, at night. On a TV show, you'll have these like drama series. 11 p.m. Which kind yeah. of. Yeah. Uh, great stuff. Um, that's the most fun you could have on TV, by the way. Okay. Um, and I really enjoy doing, making those projects. But for one day, you have 100 yen for your budget. So that's about uh, $7.5 to $8,000 for the day. Yes. And you only have 10 days to film it. All right. So, so you 12 have episodes, 10 days, and you have that. Budget. So eighty thousand dollars. Yep. Basically, to pay for everyone's salaries, everything. everyone's time, filming, editing, yep. everything. Yep. That's the low end, right? That's that. Uh, I would say that that barely covers the salary of, uh, <laughs> of some <laughs> actors in Hollywood for. Uh, oh no! It's impossible. Yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely nothing. Um, but that's that's the honest that's the honest truth of what we're working with, mm. right? Um, we make the most amount of dramas at that end because that's the most you can experiment. Um, once you get up to the cop show level, uh, which the ones like um, I do, like uh, the names that would, you would recognize would be something like Aibo mm -hmm. or Kasao Ken no Onna. Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of the cop shows that I'm talking about. And those ones are slightly larger. So you'll have for um, one season, maybe one oku. So that's about uh, $80,000? 80, 80, uh, no, like $800,000. I'm glad you have a head like yeah. that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> But you did yeah. say that most shows do lose money, right? Um, most of them, yeah. Wouldn't it be interesting just then from a financial perspective for the producers mm. to think that, okay, let's stop producing so many shows at a low budget <laughs> and let's make a, a, a high budget one that will produce for longer where you have time for the actors to rehearse, time for the directors to write out the script. Is this never, um, does this never come up in the discussions? Is it really more about just quantity over quality it's well it's definitely quantity over quality right now at the moment um, the biggest reason is that um, you know like like I mentioned before it's a big switch from um, from uh, television to now the digital world mm -hmm. right the online world so the budgets that you're going to get from a place like Netflix which um, sh it's more on the American side um, it's gonna it's gonna be a big deal you're not going to have for example such big names on most of the television dramas Because big name actors are going to be booked for years in advance, mm -hmm. right? So there is that issue. So we have, or every television, um, I'm sorry, every television kyoku, every television in station channel, yeah. channel, is going to have to deal with a very specific budget, which is actually going down every year as a mm -hmm. result of loss of sponsors. Um, there have been a few times when certain television, when certain um, uh, film companies will try to do that. So um, recently in America, they had the whole, the, the say, uh, what do you call it, Nights? The Strike for um, the TV? It's called Saint Seiya. Oh. It used to be an anime and they did a TV show. They think it's Knights of the I think Stars I know which something. one, but I don't know the name, but I think I know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what you think about it is what you think about it, yes. Colorful, colorful <laughs> Nights in Space. Yes, yeah, something, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I forgot the English Sorry name. Sorry for all the fans and we Guardians. Don't, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't work on that one. It's Toei, right? Mm. So Toei put a, um, a very large amount of money into that. And what you think about it is um, time for, you know, that's something you discuss over beer. So I'm not going to get into it because I had no too many of the people mm -hmm. involved. But um, it doesn't tend to go very well, is what I'm trying to say. Um, because they don't know, one of the biggest problems right now is that they don't really have someone who can completely control the project. There are too many people involved, too many voices involved, and the larger the budgets get, um, the more, uh, not more people, so many people are involved, but nobody wants to take a leading role, you know? Nobody wants to, nobody can. Nobody, 
I say nobody wants to. Okay. I mean, like, there's people who have the capability to do so, but they tend to be um, a company employee. And so mm. the, there's a limit to the amount of uh, responsibility that they're willing to take on. For the salary they the sake of the salary, yeah. yeah. Interesting. So it's kind of a bad balance right now. Um, I've also seen, you know, one of the most famous tele- or movie companies which um, makes all the wrong choices is Nikatsu. And Nikatsu has been making bad choices for about 100 years now. So, and they're still in business. And we don't know why, but they're still in business. <laughs> but, That's quite a story in itself. That's a script <laughs> for a movie. Nikatsu is wonderful. If you look into it, you just you just fall in love with the company. It just really is. It's been um it's been held together with like duct tape and a prayer for the last hundred years. It's the oldest film company in Japan. Mm-hmm. Um, it they they just kind of like they keep on making stuff, but they always keep on investing in weird things, and they they're touching on all the genres which they probably shouldn't be working with. Mm-hmm. And then even these days, um, they continue to make films, which is absolutely wonderful. But again and again, they're investing large amounts of money into things that don't get released, or there's some sort of a problem, or who owns what, and then it just never really materializes. And so you have this beautiful studio over there in Tokyo. It's right by my house, too. I go over there. I mean, I just finished my own film um, recently. I just did the, uh, the sound editing, mm-hmm. my own film over there. And you're walking through this studio, which has so much love and so much uh, history and all of the walls over there. And you're like, why is this place still in business? I mean, it's still being used. People are still working there. But and I'm, I have a feeling it's going to be there for the next maybe 50 years, too. But it's just it's right on the edge there the entire time. Right. So definitely, if you're interested in film mm-hmm. history, go look up um, Nikatsu and the history behind that and who, why it changed hands and who did what. And it's and I'll certainly a wonderful look it up story. Because, uh, I hope there's a Wikipedia <laughs> page on this. One. I'm Thank quite you. sure there is. But yeah, yeah. but um, go into the English, go into the Japanese one, and then use the uh, what is it, Chrome extension mm-hmm. to like Google Translate yes. it, the page because that's a lot more interesting. The, the Japanese one, uh, lots of scandals and all sorts of fun stuff. You know, Hollywood stuff. There, there are a lot so. of scandals in the movie industry. Oh right? heck yes! Yeah. <laughs> what is some of the? I mean, from what I know, there's even a, a special like a press type that focuses just on movie industry scandals. Oh and yeah, that's true. Is this something you have to? Do deal with as well as a director or is it something that then the PR of the Mm. uh, producing company will take care of? They don't like scandals here. I mean, they do. I mean, they love it, but they don't. You know how it is? Love-hate relationship with scandals. Mm. Um, There has never been any time in the history of film and theater and any country in the world which was not ridden with scandals. Mm -hmm. And there's always been problems and there will always be problems. Nothing will ever change. And I don't say that with um, a heavy heart. I actually say that as, well, that's show business, right? So right now, this is going to be, you're going to have so-and-so with scandal, which is going on right now. But in three years, it's going to be something else. And then it's going to be something else. And um, it's partially because uh, the film industry and the news industry are one and the same. So they're, they're, they have to keep on propping each other up. Mm-hmm. Right. Or, you know, tearing each other down. It's kind of the same thing. Whatever is in the news is going to be um, on the television. Right. And so whatever brings in most people well, gets the most clicks, whatever. So there's no gets such thing as bad publicity. Anymore, right? Essentially. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, people's um, unlike America, people's careers really do get destroyed by a lot of these scandals. So a lot of it is really quite dumb. Um I mean, like, why? There are a whole bunch of scandals about really silly things, which nobody really cares about, Mm -hmm. but they have to put something on the news, right? So, um, what can I say about that? (laughs) All I can say is that you kind of get used to it. Yeah, it's just part of the, one part of the job, I guess. Oh, yeah. It's there, you have to deal with it, and then, yeah. It is, I mean, like, what's sad about scandals, especially in Japan, is that a lot of them touch on um, uh, what it means to be human, right? So... Mm. In gen, there's all these bits and pieces. There's you, the were you that you want to be, and all these mistakes that you've made in your life, right? And you don't usually broadcast the mistakes. You try not to broadcast the mistakes, right? Mm-hmm. And but eventually, maybe sometimes a mistake gets out, you know. And then normal person will look at him and be like, eh, he, guy bumped my shoulder. Eh, what a jerk, and you'll forget about it. But the movie and the film industry, they're going to, oh, the guy bumped my shoulder. <gasps> scandal, scandal, scandal. And you'll get all this stuff on the news about the guy who bumped your shoulder. And the average person will ideally would think of themselves, and they'll be like, oh, well, I've bumped a shoulder before too. Oh, my goodness. And you'll you kind of recognize that there's a sense of humanity in the mistakes that the person has made. Mm-hmm. 
and you realize you may have made something similar kind of, similar kind of mistake. But the, the television industry doesn't see it that way. And bumping the, sh bumping the shoulder is all of a sudden like a big like issue. And um, they make a whole big deal out about it. And then they talk about, oh, we have to make laws so that no one can bump anybody's shoulder. And let's run and away with it. All <laughs> right? started from a bump on a movie set. Right? Yeah. yeah. Something silly like that will end up becoming like a mountain. So I would like to encourage anyone who sees mm -hmm. these scandals to take it with a big grain of salt. Or just ignore them. Just oh, it's just yeah. ignore them is even nicer. <laughs> So yeah. for you, what's next? You mentioned you just uh, finished editing the sound for yeah. one of your next releases. What yes. is it? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Can you tell us yes, when um, it's going to be released? And well, actually, I can tell you about this one because it doesn't belong to any big company. That's mm -hmm. why. Um, during the pandemic, I had a house. I had a big film. I have a film crew of my own and um, I had some time. So I threw together a movie. Uh, it's an 82 minute film. It's called mm -hmm. Ching Ton Sham. Um, this project is, it took, it's two years in the making because everyone on it was practically volunteer. Mm -hmm. So I just had time and my sound guy had time and my cameraman got, and they had time. So they were like, okay, fine. And so um, it, it was easy to film it and the editing was all right. It wasn't hard to film that, but you know, coloring takes time. And um, in order to use Nikatsu Studio or wherever it may be at a low, a low price, you have to kind of um, book the same time as another large film, yes. right? And so then they'll, you know, if they have 15 minutes off that day, then they'll help you with you your You have film. 15 minutes to shoot your show. And just yeah, well, basically that's how it really works. A lot of the industry, it's a lot of sharing and bartering. Mm -hmm. Um, but this one, I just, yesterday, I turned that into the um, Osaka Asian Film Festival. So two years ago, I uh, showed another one of my um, mm -hmm. films. It was called uh, Random Call. And that was a uh, world premiere over at the Osaka Asian Film Festival. So now we might get yes. a world premiere again in hopefully, Osaka. Hopefully, hopefully. So we'll have you back. Yes, that'd be wonderful. Please, guys, let me in. <laughs> so, but I turned that in and all those are going to be, um, they're subtitled in English, mm -hmm. of course. And what I want to do with these particular films is I want to get them um, put onto a platform where anyone can see them for free. So yes, they're um, independent films, right? But uh, all the people who are working on the film pr um, project themselves are like high level professionals. So for example, I was just saying about the sound that I just finished over mm -hmm. in um, Nikatsu. Well, my sound guy is a five-time winner of the Japanese Academy Award. So he's an excellent veteran who knows what he's doing. Everyone is. And so you get some really good quality work, uh, which is going to be available out there for free, hopefully. Um, I would like that. Does so. it have a name already? Well, the film itself is called Chin Tonshan. Oh, yeah, sorry. You yes. Chin Tonshan, which means? Yes. So when you learn any Japanese performing art, whether it be shamisen or whether it be dance, there is a, a three beat, um, there was a one, there's like a one, two, three, one, two, three mm -hmm. kind of a rhythm to whatever it is that you're being taught. So for example, if you're doing a dance thing, then you, there's a way for you to move your chin, right? So you look here and then you look there and then you go back. So that's called chin ton shang, right? That one particular dance movement mm -hmm. or anything that you do. So it's chin ton shang with your movements. So a three-step movement. It's a three-step mm -hmm. kind of a rhythm. And so when you're first learning something, everything is learned on this three, one, two, three movement. And that's the words, qin, tong, shan, is that particular kind of performing art learning movement. And in this story, this particular character, a lovely little lady who um, meets a ghost in her uh, while she's under quarantine, mm -hmm. um, learns how to so do So many people kind of experience. Oh, yeah. When Maybe not the ghost part, the but yeah, <laughs> the quarantine. Certainly. But yeah, while she's doing that, she'll, um, she learns uh, a little bit about performing arts mm -hmm. and also learns, you know, through it, how to move on with her life now that her life has been destroyed as a young person during, you know, the coronavirus. So um, she's learning her one, two, threes, and therefore the story is um, Chin Ton Xiang. I'm really looking forward to it. I hope we can have it here in Osaka as a world premiere. I hope premiere. so. That would be very exciting. When would you know? Uh, when would that be? The Osaka well, um, the Osaka, uh, it's usually in March. Okay. So hopefully it'll be 2024 mm -hmm. March. Um, as soon as I know about it, I'm allowed to say uh, whether or not it's in or not. I'm going to know that um, in February. Fingers so. crossed. Everybody cross fingers for me, please. <laughs> Yeah, Ricky, I've, thank you very much. I think we talked about a lot of different topics. It was super interesting. Is there maybe something about the movie industry in Japan, about your experience as a director that we didn't touch upon that you feel like, oh, it would have been interesting to share this story or this anecdote? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, at the moment, I don't yeah, have one. I think we, did, did we cover most of it? 
I think you probably did. Well, I if we didn't did. do and people have questions, uh, hopefully we can have the questions in the comments and then we can share them with you and maybe give them more answers. Sure, I'd be happy to. Because yeah. this was a very interesting conversation. So thank you very much for coming all the way from Tokyo today. Thank you for having me all the way in Osaka. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was nice to have you. This was Fish and Rice, Stories from Japan. Uh, we had Ricky today talking about directing movies and the movie scene in Japan. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you again next week. Thank you.